All right, let's talk about um, the most important, arguably, measures of variability, which are the variance and the standard deviation. Now, the standard deviation is easier to understand, but the variance actually is more important in the long run in statistics, and we'll deal with them both. So we need to understand how to calculate them and how to interpret them. And these, these two measures are not robust. These are like the mean. They're very similar, so the, they're based on the mean, in fact. But they are extremely important and useful, so we spend a lot of time trying to collect data that uh, are sort of bell-shaped and normal in a histogram and that don't have extreme outliers and that don't have too much skew to them. Because if we can use variance and standard deviation, we have huge advantages as far as the kinds of statistics we can do in the inferential sense when we're trying to basically answer hypothesis testing questions. That's all inference all the way down. So the standard deviation in words, this is a definition. It's the average difference between any given score and its mean, or the average difference between all the average difference um, between the individual observations and the mean. So it's an average difference between scores, but not just between each other on average, but between them and the mean. So it's average means uh, average is indicated by the word standard, which was uh, say a hundred years ago a little more commonly used to mean something like like average and deviation still means difference. We talk about deviation quite frequently in mathematics and statistics to mean a difference between any two things. So the standard deviations is, is the average difference and it means the average deviation of the scores from the mean of the scores and the logic goes like this why isn't everything the mean? <laughs> so you, you start out with um, a, a mean sort of in this weird theoretical sense and then all the scores are the mean but then they start to deviate for reasons that we don't necessarily understand. So we do research to figure out why they deviated. Why is there this variability? Why is there this spread? So now you're starting to get, I, I hope, why spread is so important. This is going to be a bit of a long lecture, by the way. So the conceptual logic of the standard deviation is that we need a measure of variability that's sensitive to all the scores. Now the IQR is great, but it's not sensitive to all the scores. It's based only on Q1 and Q3, and those two things are only based on a small number of the data of the data points. The advantage of the IQR is that it's not sensitive to extreme outliers, but the disadvantage is it's not sensitive to an awful lot of the other data in, in a data set either. So you sacrifice something for that robustness. But we do have a mean, and a mean is sensitive to all the scores. So let's calculate variability based on the mean. Let's see, let's calculate something that tells us how variable our individual scores are around the mean. How much higher and lower than the mean on average are all the rest of the numbers. So what's the average difference from the average? That's another way to say this. So we calculate the average deviation of a group of scores from their own mean by calculating a deviation for each individual value of x. So we take a specific value of x and we subtract from that the mean of all the x's. The reason we go this direction, rather than saying mean minus observation, so it's going to be x minus x bar, not x bar minus x, because x bar is the mean. The reason we care about this is a very small reason. Because when we do deviations like this, and we get in the habit of doing deviations like this, then numbers that were higher than x will have a positive deviation. And numbers that were, or sorry, numbers that are higher than x bar, than the mean, will have a positive deviation. And numbers that are lower than their own mean will have a negative deviation. And that's extremely intuitive and useful for some other things that we're doing. And just making sense of our data as we go along. So we find the mean, and we want to say find each score's deviation from the mean, and then find the average of those deviations. And that seems completely logical and wonderful. You run into a few problems. One of them is actually not a very big problem. Um, one of the big problems is that the average deviation from the mean is zero, always. And as a matter of fact, mathematically, you can prove that it always has to be zero. When you calculate a mean, the mean is the center of gravity, or the balance point in your data. So there is always the same weight of numbers above the mean as there is below the mean. It doesn't mean it's the same deviations, but when you add them all up, they mean the same thing. So the sum of the positives always cancels out the sum of the negative deviations. So here's an example of this. Here's some numbers. I made them into a kind of a rough little histogram by using x's. Uh, let's say these are quiz scores or something like that. The mean is there around 5.2 or something. Well, there's the deviation of that first x from the mean. That's the size of that deviation. Imagine that that deviation is 
um, a stick or a piece of metal that's that long. And there's this deviation and there's this deviation. So each of these has a deviation. Imagine that each of these deviations is a piece of metal and the longer it is the more it weighs. Right? So it has more weight if it's bigger. So all these deviations are here. And now imagine that this blue thing is where the point on a teeter-totter goes. And that's one definition of the mean. It's the balance point um, that divides the data set into two pieces, not with an equal number of observations on each side. That's what the median does. But it divides based on a different set of criteria. It divides so that the sum of the deviations on one side is equal to the sum of the deviations on the other side. So what happens here is that the negative deviations, the one, the deviations of all the values that are below the mean, will always exactly cancel out the positive deviations. So how can we keep the scores from canceling each other out? Well, it's actually pretty easy. You just do absolute value, right? The absolute value, just do absolute value of x minus x bar and then add them all up and take the average of that. And that's actually a completely reasonable approach. And there is a statistic based on this called the median absolute deviation, MAD. And some people really love it. Some people use it instead of the standard deviation. Unfortunately, we prefer to do something different to make the deviations positive. We square them. If you square anything, it becomes positive. The square of negative 2 is positive 4, etc. So a positive thing squared is a positive, and a negative thing squared is a positive. So Squaring things acts like absolute, um, or acts like absolute value, but squared. So if you square something and then unsquare it, you'll have the same thing you had before, but now it will be positive no matter what. That's a quick way to do absolute value if you don't have absolute value on your calculator, for instance. So now we know the squared deviation. Now we say, okay, we can square this deviation, but we want the average squared deviation. Now we could just unsquare this now and say we have the unsquared deviation. We could just uh, unsquare that. Square it and then unsquare it and then take the average. And that would also be very reasonable, but it's not what we do. There are some mathematical reasons why not. So the mean squared deviation would be taking all the deviations that have already been squared and divided by n. And there are reasons why we do this. This is going to be the variance, by the way. You square all the deviations, and then you take the average of the squared deviations. And that's what that formula looks like. This sigma over here just says take the sum of all this stuff. So you do all this stuff in the parentheses first. One at a time, you take every x and you subtract from it the mean. This will always be the same number because these are all from the same data set. But if there's 20 numbers in the data set, you'll do 20 of these deviations, x minus x bar. And you'll square the deviations because you do exponents before adding, and summing is just adding. So you do all this stuff first for each number, and you get all these squared deviations. You add up all the squared deviations, and then you divide by n. That'll give you the average squared deviation. So this is actually a very useful quantity for inferential statistics. This is called the variance. And the variance is a squared quantity. If we had inches, then the variance is squared inches. If we had you know, questionnaire responses, the variance is squared questionnaire responses. It's extremely abstract and strange sometimes, and we don't really know what to make of it. But it's super useful later because we treat it like a substance. We say how much variance is there. We divide the variance between this and that factor. We try and determine where this amount of variance came from versus this other amount of variance came from. And we put gratuitous pictures of Robin up here. So the standard deviation, we're still not quite there yet. We still don't have an average deviation. We have an average squared deviation. So we just unsquare it now. Finally, we unsquare it. Finally, we go back to units that make some sense. So the standard deviation is the square root of the variance, or the variance is a squared standard deviation. They just flip-flop back and forth like that. They're basically the same thing. In other words, the, the standard deviation is now the average deviation of scores from the mean by an extremely roundabout process. There were like four different ways to make this simpler along the way, and we chose not to do any of them because these squared deviations are, have really cool properties that help us solve some really tricky problems in inferential statistics later on. So this is the formula for a standard deviation.
you just do the variance and then you take the square root of the whole thing after you're all done. Calculate everything, get a variance, a single number, and then you take the square root of that, and that's the standard deviation. So flip-flopping back and forth between the standard deviation and the variance is super, super easy. You just square one or unsquare it. Square and square root, square and square root. And the symbols incorporate that. The standard deviation of the population is indicated by a lowercase sigma. And the variance of a population is a lowercase sigma squared. And in fact, mathematically, it is the standard deviation squared, right? So that's handy. And, but with sample statistics, we use a different notation. Just like the mean, we use a, a Greek lowercase mu for a population mean, but x bar for a sample mean. Same thing here. We use the Greek lowercase sigma and sigma squared for population values. So if we have all the values and we can calculate um, the population parameters based on that and calculate the variance or standard deviation, we, we indicate that with a sigma or sigma squared. Or when we're just imagining those values, we use sigma and sigma squared. But the standard deviation in the, in the sample, we just use a lowercase s. So sigma, s, they're the same thing. Lowercase s and s squared. So let's look at some terminology here. Um, let's say dog height s equals 23.5 centimeters. Which one is this? I'll tell you. Oh, I thought I would tell you. S, it's not a Greek letter, so you know it's going to be sample. And it's not squared, so you know it's standard deviation. So this is number two, standard deviation of a sample. Number of Fs a person got in college, a um, whole bunch of different people. Sigma squared equals 18.3. That is a population variance. It's a Greek letter, so it's from the population. And it's squared, so it's variance, not standard deviation. Airplane top speed, sigma 63.2 kilometers per hour. That's a really slow airplane. Maybe it's a model airplane. So it's a sigma, so it's a population value. Um, and it's not squared, so it's standard deviation. So this is the standard deviation of the population, so number one. The gross domestic product, uh, the, the standard deviation is $94.3 billion. Well, this is uh, a sample value because it's an S and not a sigma. And it's not squared, so it's standard deviation. Now, keep in mind, when you have gross domestic product, S equals, this means you had a whole bunch of gross domestic products. This is, a, this is, one, little piece, this is one little statistic telling you something about a sample. So you have a sample of gross domestic, domestic products. So either you have multiple nations or you have one nation sampled at multiple points in time. You need a data set to get this stuff. Number of tiles in the residential bathrooms. So this means there must have been many, many bathrooms and you're trying to get the variability. Somewhere there's a mean number of tiles across all bathrooms and this is the variability. It's an S, so it's from the sample and it's squared, so it is variance. So it's sample variance for. Now, uh, I think we might have encountered this before, but if not, here it is. Sample statistics are estimates of population parameters, yes. We've done this. And this is the case whether you realize it or not. Sample statistics are the estimates of the population parameters that they correspond to. So assumptions matter even if you don't realize that you're making your assumptions. If your data are a sample, then they come from a population. And being able to recognize that fact and recognize which population they probably come from is both tricky and extremely important. So if a sample mean is an estimate of the population mean, then a sample standard deviation or variance is an estimate of the population standard deviation. Just by calculating that st sample standard deviation and by saying sample and thinking of this in any way like a sample, you have just estimated the population standard, devi standard deviation. And we're very concerned with making sure that that estimate is accurate. Now we can't know whether it's accurate right now, but you can run simulations and you can use mathematical theory to figure out which process will, over time, give you the most accurate results. And as it turns out, um, you need to use different formulas now for sample versus population standard deviation and variance. Because the sample standard deviation and variance, they already include the mean in every calculation. The mean is an estimate of the population uh, mean, right? The sample mean is an estimate, x bar, the sample mean is an estimate of the population mean. And we use that estimate to make another estimate. So we're doubling up, we're cheating. We've got one estimate use, being used to help us make an estimate of another thing. 
or to make another estimate. So we use this correction factor that we plug into the formula to prevent this cheating or prevent its consequences to get our calculations back to being accurate, it, or what we would call unbiased. So here's another basic principle, no cheating, if you want accurate results. And so to not cheat, you have to do this business. If you have population variance and standard deviation, you use these formulas. Here's your population variance, sum of x minus x bar quantity squared over n. Standard deviation is the same thing, but you just take the square root of that whole thing. And for the sample, you plug an n minus 1 into the denominator. And that's how you keep yourself from experiencing the consequences of cheating by double dipping, by, uh, I don't know, stacking, doubling up, unfairly doubling up on your estimates. And it actually makes those estimates bigger. And we don't like big variance, so, but what can we do? We have big variance because we have a sample. We're being punished for our ignorance, as is, has been noted before.